Okay, so can you see my slide? Yes, great, thank you. So we have a couple of minutes, so we'll give people time to come on. See, many people are on already, so welcome. I'll give it a couple more minutes for people to get going. It's early in some parts of the US, not so early in Europe. Here they come. Here comes everybody waiting for us to start broadcasting. So thank you all for your patience. So I know it's about 12 noon here right now, which is the start time. We'll just give it a couple of minutes, or one more minute actually. I know all of you are here in such a timely fashion. I don't want to keep you all waiting. So as our speakers are getting ready, I think what we'll do is we will start So I would like to welcome you all to day three of the International E3 Summit. My name is Eileen Michelli, and I am a Chief Program Officer for the Foundation. Um, my colleague Deborah Goodman is there. Um, give a wave, Deborah. She's going to be in the chat box, so um, she'll be keeping up with all those details and questions that you have not related to the topic. Um, the, the, the questions for the topic will go in the Q&A. So we're thrilled to have you here participating with us. Um, this summit is brought to you by the Marfan Foundation, along with our divisions, the Lois Deep Syndrome Foundation, and the VEDS Movement, and our partners in Europe at Vicern. We are really grateful to our presenting sponsors for this event, um, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and American Communications Construction. Today, we are fortunate to have with us Dr. Julie DeBacker and Dr. Guillaume Jando, who are going to present to all of you on post-cardiac care and management, um, post-cardiac surgery care and management. We're also thrilled that we have Diana Moss from the Netherlands here to share her personal perspective. So without further ado, let's, let's start going with um, Diana's presentation. Hi, um, my, name Oops. my name is Diana Maas. Uh, I live near Amsterdam. And I'm going to talk to you about my experience after surgery. Um, I got Marfan from my mother when I was about six years old. Uh, I do have a sister and she is not diagnosed with Marfan's. Uh, we skip in time um, and I'm about 20 years old when I got my first aortic surgery in the abdomen. Um, and many more after that. Uh, about 15, I guess. Um, so there's not a piece of aorta in me that's still my own. It's all sands, grafts, prosthetics. Um, and um, every year I need to go back to the hospital and get my CT scan or a sonogram that varies every other year. Um, so it's not that after surgery you're done. You need to stay in contact with your doctors. Um, try to follow up their advice. For example, on exercising. Um, know your limits, uh, but exercise, it's important. Um, and what's helped me most is follow your own instinct. If there, you think there's something wrong with your body, go see the doctor. It helped me. Actually, it saved my life three times. So, um, and try to reduce stress 
as much as possible because this is a very, very big factor um, and uh, not very helpful. So um, I can tell you a whole lot on aortic surgery and maybe you have questions. Let me know. Thank you so much, Diana, for that. I'm gonna try to shut my video off here now. And now we're gonna go on to this incredible presentation that we have from Dr. Zondo and Dr. DeBecker. Um, Diana, you can shut your webcam off now. Thank you so much. So welcome to this online session on postoperative care and management after aortic surgery, which is part of the E3 Summit organized by the Marfan Foundation together with the European Reference Network for Rare Hereditary Vascular Disorders, FASCURN. My name is Julie de Bakker. I am a genetic cardiologist working at the University Hospital in Ghent in Belgium, where I am responsible for the Marfan Clinic. I am the chairman of the Heritable Thoracic Aortic Disease Group within Vascurn, and it is my pleasure to hold this session together with Professor Guillaume Chandot from Paris, who is coordinator of Vascurn. We will start this presentation with an introduction after which we will reply to questions prepared by the patient organizations. So before going further into the topic of postoperative management, we would like to define a few concepts. We would also like to emphasize that there will be several sessions during the summit in the coming weeks that will also address surgical aspects of aortic disease. So in this session, we are specifically addressing the postoperative management. So let us start by defining the disease. We're talking about heritable thoracic aortic disease, which is a heterogeneous group of conditions that share the common feature of aneurysms or dissections of the thoracic aorta. A distinction needs to be made between syndromic forms such as Marfan syndrome, Lewis Dietz syndrome, and aneurysm osteoarthritis syndrome. In addition, there is also a group of patients or families where the aortic problem occurs isolated. So that means without clear other manifestations. This can then occur either sporadically as in one patient or familial with multiple affected family members. Genetic testing has become increasingly important in the context of HTAD, also given its wider availability and more acceptable cost in recent years. In syndromic forms, a genetic defect or a mutation will be found in the majority of patients, and this percentage is much lower in the non-syndromic cases, which is about 15 to 20 percent. Demonstration of a genetic defect is important to confirm the diagnosis, to set up screening in the family or family planning, and is also increasingly used to help determine the indication for surgery. As seen in this next slide, uh, the concept of gene-based surgical approach is more widely used recently, but we would like to emphasize that these are guidelines that are not evidence-based yet, and that every decision to proceed with surgery is still an individual decision, not only taking genes and diameters into account. Your treating physician will carefully determine the indication together with you. So, when we're talking about aortic aneurysms, these are local enlargements of the vessel of the aorta, and these can occur at different locations as il illustrated in this figure. Aneurysms typically do not cause any pain or complaints, but with increasing growth of an aneurysm, there is a risk for tearing of the vessel, which is then called a dissection. It is important to make a distinction between a type A aortic dissection, so localized in the ascending part of the aorta, which is a surgical emergency, and type B dissections, which are located in the descending part, which are usually treated medically, at least in the initial stages. So in addition to aortic problems being an indication for surgery in HTAP patients, mitral valve prolapse may be another indication for surgery in some patients. And this can be needed either as a primary intervention or concomitant with aortic surgery. Mitral valve prolapse is illustrated in this video where you can see the thickened valve leaflets which are prolapsing into the left atrium with each heartbeat. When mitral valve prolapse causes valve regurgitation, surgical repair may be indicated. 
According to the indication for surgery, different surgical procedures will be required. Surgery of the ascending part of the aorta or the aortic root require a sternotomy, meaning that your chest bone needs to be opened. And the aneurysm part of, aneurysmal part of the aorta will be replaced using so-called valve sparing techniques, leaving the native valve into place, or may be replaced along with the aortic valve using a valve prosthesis. To approach the descending part of the aorta, the surgeons need to have a different axis, which is called a thoracotomy, which is an incision on the side of your chest. Open surgery is still the method of choice in patients with HTAD, but so-called endovascular procedures, or TVAR, are gaining importance for specific indications. Surgery of the abdominal aorta requires a so-called laparotomy, whereby the abdominal wall will be opened and here too, endovascular procedures are gaining field. In some cases, and especially in the case of anticipated problems at the level of the aortic arch or the more descending parts, hybrid procedures will be performed, which means that open surgery is combined with the placement of an endovascular stent, which is then called an elephant trunk procedure as illustrated in the picture on the right-hand corner of this uh, slide. In the case of mitral valve surgery, again, the sternotomy will be required in many cases. And this will definitely be the case when it needs to be combined with aortic surgery. But minimally invasive procedures are increasing in frequency and can be an option in case of isolated mitral valve repair. The mitral valve will be either repaired with so-called plasty or the valve may be replaced by a prosthesis. A very important difference both on the short-term and long-term outcome of cardiac surgery is whether the procedure was performed in an emergency setting or in an elective setting. Emergency interventions usually come with a much higher, not only operative risk, but also higher risks on the long-term, which is the main reason why prophylactic, while planned surgical procedures should be aimed for in all patients. So what about postoperative care and management after cardiac surgery? Let us start with the immediate postoperative course. Usually patients will remain on the intensive care unit for 24 to 48 hours after the surgical procedures. Patients will remain hospitalized for an average duration of one week. And during hospitalization, recovery with intensive physical rehabilitation will start in an early stage. In most cases, a control outpatient visit with the surgeon or with the cardiologist or together will be scheduled six weeks after surgery. Antithrombotics, such as aspirin, will be prescribed for one up to six months after an aortic prosthesis placement or after valve repair. Anticoagulants, which are required in the case of mechanical valves, will be needed in lifelong in patients having such prosthesis. I will come back to that in a minute. Treatment with beta blockers or angiotensin receptor blockers definitely need to be continued after the surgery in the same schedule as given prior to the procedure. <coughs> Recovery times vary from, from one patient to another. On average, it usually takes three to six months to feel back to normal and this will depend on your health and activity level before the surgery. Things you can do to improve this postoperative course include engaging into regular and appropriate physical exercise, eat healthy, and please do not smoke. So items that are important in the later postoperative care and management in patients with cardiac surgery are listed here and include surveillance, anticoagulants, pregnancy, sport activities, endocarditis prophylaxis, and reinterventions. We will now briefly discuss each of these items in the next few minutes. So let us start with surveillance. It goes without saying that also after having undergone cardiac surgery, you will need ongoing follow-up with your treating physician. <coughs> surveillance regimens will depend on the type of surgery you have undergone and will again be individualized. In case you had elective aortic aneurysm repair or valve surgery, you will typically have an outpatient visit with your cardiologist or surgeon after four to six weeks. 
at which time an echocardiography will be performed. After that, you will be seen after six months usually, and in most cases, this will then go back to yearly visits. In case you had an aortic dissection, more regular visits, especially in the beginning, will be sch scheduled. And in this case, scanning in addition to echo echocardiography is also required. So there will be a first visit after a month, like in the other surgical procedures. And then there will be a next visit after three months, and again after six months. After that, follow-up will depend on the baseline variables after the surgery. It will be once a year if the condition is stable and can be more frequently if indicated. Again, these follow-up schemes are very individually defined and these are just general rules that we are displaying here. If you have undergone cardiac surgery with replacement of your aortic or mitral valve by a mechanical prosthesis, you will need lifelong treatment with anticoagulants. Vitamin K anticoagulants such as warfarin or acenocumerol are the only safe option in this setting. Newer types, the so-called NOAX, are not indicated in patients with mechanical valves. All patients on vitamin K antagonists require regular, regular control of the level of blood thinning, which is done with measurement of the so-called INR. In case you have an aortic mechanical valve, the INR values need to be between 2 and 2.5. In case of a mitral valve, these values are higher between 2.5 and 3.5. Usually, patients need a monthly control of the INR, but extra controls are needed when you have an illness or you need other drugs, and this is especially the case when you need antibi antibiotics. It is important to know that patients on anticoagulants need to switch to heparin. So uh, usually this will be low molecular weight heparins with subcutaneous injection in case of a planned surgery with a high bleeding risk. And this needs to be carefully discussed with your physician uh, prior to this uh, intervention. It is also recommended to avoid vitamin K administration or conakion in case of bleeding, um, as this may cause prolonged um, this regulation of your INR value. So this needs to be discussed, of course, with the physician and will depend on the situation you are in, but it's, it's not recommended to apply these, uh, these drugs. So what about pregnancy after cardiac surgery? We need to take into account a couple of risks in patients with HTAD, and especially in those who have had prior cardiac surgery. In patients having had replacement of the ascending aorta or the root, there is an ongoing risk of type B aortic dissection after the procedure. There is also an increased risk for valvular thrombosis in those patients who have mechanical valves, and also in those patients due to their need for anticoagulants, there is an evident risk of bleeding. Whether or not you had prior surgery, um, a careful preconception counseling is mandatory, and this should involve not only the cardiologists or the surgeons, but also the obstetricians and the anesthesiologists. The same as in patients who have not undergone surgery, but even more so in a postoperative setting, full aortic imaging using preferably MRI or CT is mandatory to look for possible problems in the more distal parts of the aorta. A pregnancy is formally contraindicated in all patients with a previous history of um, aortic dissection. Anticoagulants pose a specific problem during pregnancy. So vitamin K antagonists are teratogenic, which means that they can cause harm to the developing fetus, especially when higher doses are required. So depending on whether you need more than five milligrams per day of warfarin or more than three milligrams per day of acinocumarol. Specific schemes have been developed. These are the schemes from the European Society of Cardiology, but there are others available. And as a general rule, patients on lower doses can continue their treatments. Patients on higher doses will need to switch to heparin in the early and late stages of pregnancy. As is also the case in patients who have not undergone previous surgery, a careful check of other drugs you are taking is needed well before the pregnancy. So it is known that angiotensin receptor blockers such as losartan are harmful for the fetus and these need to be discontinued prior to the pregnancy. 
It is recommended to take beta blockers throughout pregnancy, and in this case, the so-called beta-1 selective blockers are prefer preferred because um, these have less effect on the developing fetus. These include metoprolol and bisoprolol as examples. There is a small risk of intrauterine growth retardation when on these drugs, and this needs to be taken into, into account and carefully monitored. Pregnant women will need careful surveillance throughout their pregnancy, usually with echocardiography every six to eight weeks. And an MRI during pregnancy is possible. It is safe, but it is rarely indicated. Uh, but in, as I said, in some cases, it may be um, needed. As for the delivery, um, uh, a tertiary um, center delivery with cardiac surgery um, available is recommended in higher risk situations. So this is especially the case in those patients where the diameter during pregnancy of the aorta um, has increased and in uh, all cases of mechanical valves. The preference goes to vaginal uh, delivery, delivery in all patients, but again, as I have often mentioned during this presentation, this is an individual decision and needs to be carefully discussed uh, with your uh, treating physicians. We also kindly refer you to more details on pregnancy and more specialized sessions during this summit. So my name is uh, Guillaume Jondeau and I'm going to cover the last three topics, port activities, endocarditis and reinterventions. after Julie Baker covered the first three. For exercise after surgery, it's the same problem as exercise before surgery and it's a difficult problem. It's the same problem as before surgery because the entire aorta is affected by the disease and usually not the entire aorta is replaced, meaning that it remains aorta which is uh, fragile and which is weakened by the disease and that you want to avoid stress on it. And the problem with the exercise is that it increases the blood pressure. But you know also that there is a benefit for uh, doing regular exercise. And when you speak about exercise, actually you can divide it, the exercises in two groups, dynamic exercise versus static exercise. Dynamic exercise, it's cycling, it's running, it's swimming. And during this type of exercise, the vessels are dilated, which means that the resistance to the ejection of the blood flow from the left ventricle is decreasing, meaning that the blood pressure remains stable. It's not increased because it's delivering more blood in open vessels. This is not the case when there is a static exercise. Doing static exercise, alterophilia is the archetype of this type of exercise, then there is no vasodilation because the muscles are compressing the vessels. And then there is a rise in blood pressure, which is very important. So this one is beneficial, this one is deleterious. And the beneficial effect of dynamic exercise can be seen in everyone, you know that. It's decreasing the weight, it's decreasing the blood pressure, it's decreasing the cholesterol, it prevents diabetes, it's anti elderly on the arteries, but it can be even more beneficial in patients with Marfan syndrome. This is a recent study which has been performed in mouse wild type are normal mouse and they are growing so there is an increase in the aortic dilatation the dilatation rate which is above zero which is normal and the mouse with the Marfan syndrome is dilating more but those who are exercising regularly with dynamic exercise are dilating less and at the end of nine months we see that the aortic diameter is lower in those who did exercise so may be beneficial in exercising with dynamic exercise, even more in patients with Parfum syndrome than in everyone, even if it's beneficial in everyone. So the, the recommendation of the European Society of Cardiology, ESC, is that patients should be advised to avoid exertion at maximal capacity, to avoid ex competitive exertion, to avoid contact, this is for the ectopia lentis, and to avoid isometric sports. American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, this is similar, strenuous lifting, pushing, which is isometric, 
and straining that would require a Valsalva maneuver. So this requires some explanation. It means that the intensity of the exercise requires that you do a Valsalva maneuver, but the Valsalva maneuver per se is not deleterious. All these recommendations, uh, you see everybody agrees, but the level of evidence C, meaning that there is no really evidence for that. So everybody agrees. It seems logical, but there is no proof. So that was sports activities after surgery. Now the next topic is endocarditis prophylaxis. So what is endocarditis? Endocarditis is the infection of a valve. It can be also infection of other material like a pacemaker, but usually it's a valve. And to have endocarditis, it's favored by two things. First, there has to be bacteria or fungi, pathogens in the blood then can reach the valve. And second, it can, the risk is increased in certain heart conditions, and usually this pathology of the valve. This is because the flux, the blood flux, is not regular if there is a leak or if there is a material or something, and then it facilitates the fact that the bacteria is going on the valve. So there are two ways you can prevent endocarditis. The first is non-specific prevention measures, which are aiming at decreasing the bacteria or the fungi or every pathogen that you have in your blood. So this is true for everybody, but this is more important in people who have higher risk of endocarditis because of their uh, heart problem. And the main thing is strict dental and cutaneous hygiene. Dental follow-up should be performed twice a year in high-risk patients and early in the others. Really, dental is really key because most of the infections are coming from the uh, mouth. Obviously, you should disinfect once. You should eradicate or decrease the chronic bacterial carriage, this is skin or urine for specific problems. You have to use antibiotics for bacterial infection, but, but no self-medication with antibiotics. It's not because you have a fever that you have to take antibiotics. If you have a fever, you have to go to a doctor who knows which is the pathogen and then gives you antibiotics if necessary, and eventually ask for analysis to know which antibiotics is good for you. But you do, should not take antibiotics without an advice because it's going to make the bacteria disappear. It will be very difficult to know which is the bacteria which is responsible for the infection. And if the antibiotic is not working, it, very, it will be very difficult to find the right uh, antibiotic for you. So no self-medication with antibiotics really. Strict infection control measures for any at-risk procedures, that's for the doctors, discourage pursing and tattooing. And that's maybe a problem for some of the young patients with Marfan syndrome, but yeah, it's better to avoid. That's the European Society of Cardiology uh, recommendation anyway. Uh, then you want to give antibiotics when there is a very high risk of infection. And before in the Ancient years, 10 years ago, for example, antibiotics were given a lot. But now, there is a decrease in the rate of antibiotics given, and everybody agrees on that. Today, antibiotics before dental procedures are only recommended for patients with the highest risk of infective endocarditis. Those who have a prosthetic heart valve, bioprothesis, mechanical valve, but not the valvuloplasty, unless there is a prosthetic material, which means that if you have a valve sparing surgery with no prosthetic material, then you don't have to have antibiotics before dental procedures. Okay. The other high risk group is the history of endocarditis. So this is American Heart Association. And you see that the European Society of Cardiology, they agree, it's exactly the same thing. Any prosthetic valve, including transcatheter valve, or those in whom any prosthetic material was used for cardiac valve repair, and patients with previous infective endocarditis. 
but not in the other forms. This means that antibiotic prophylaxis is not recommended for patients at intermediate risk. Any other form of native valve disease, which means no prophylaxis for bicuspid aortic valve, no prophylaxis for mitral valve prolapse, which is something that patients with Marfan syndrome can have, and calcific uh, aortic stenosis. Now, which are the procedures which are, are high risk? Again, dental procedures and antibiotic prophylaxis should only be considered for dental procedures requiring manipulation, da -da 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 -da. that's for the dentist. But this antibiotic is not recommended for other dental procedures, not recommended for respiratory tract procedures, not recommended for gastrointestinal or skin or soft tissue procedures. Meaning that actually you don't have to give antibiotics to everyone. And when you give antibiotics, it's amoxicillin or ampicillin, two gram orally. Or clindamycin if there is an allergy. So that was endocarditis prophylaxis. Now the last topic I have to cover is ray interventions. <coughs> so you have to divide two different uh, situations. One is after prophylactic surgery, then the risk is to have to redo surgery for the ascending aorta. The aorta was dilated, you have prophylactic aortic surgery, and there is a risk to have surgery again because of valve dysfunction, for example. And valve dysfunction can occur after valve sparing surgery, and that's the reason why valve sparing is difficult, because there is a risk for a leak for aortic regurgitation. The valve dysfunction can occur after bioprosthesis because we know that after 10 or 15 years, there is going to be a problem usually, and you have to change the bioprosthesis. You can do that by redo surgery, and now more and more by TAVI, transaortic valve insertion, that you can see the catheter going into the aorta and the valve delivered at the aortic, wall, at the aortic level. And in mechanical valves, the thrombosis is the main problem, meaning that anticoagulation is really crucial, but you had the topic covered already by Julie de Bakker at the beginning. After endocarditis, you can need to, sometimes it, there is a need for surgery to remove the infection. And lastly, because of Fels aneurysm, uh, which is uh, occurring usually early, and you have a CT scanner six months after surgery to make sure everything is okay. This is really rare. The second situation, which is very different, is if surgery has been done for RT dissection. Because dissected aorta is weakened, and the risk is dilatation of the dissected aorta. So the first question is, is there remaining dissected aorta? If there is no remaining dissected aorta, because a surgeon has been able to remove all the aorta during the surgery, then there is no increased risk for that. If there is remaining dissected aorta, there is a risk for progression for dilatation because the aortic wall is divided by two. You can see half here, half here. Usually that's a descending aorta, which is a problem. And uh, you have to image regularly the entire aorta, which means either RMN uh, or a CT scanner. There are two ways you can repair it. You can do surgery, you remove the dilated aorta and you put uh, an open, a few open surgery a graft, or you can try to put a stent inside. So this is not really recommended for patients with Marfan syndrome, but it's, a lot of progress are being made and this is more and more becoming possible. And then they can be surgery as uh, in everyone for other reasons. Uh, specifically mitral valve, this mitral valve prolapse is going to be uh, responsible for uh, mitral regurgitation and surgery may be, necessary, may be necessary. But usually it's, mitral valve uh, surgery is rare in patients with Marfan syndrome. Coronary artery disease or any other thing, like everyone. And then to conclude, I just uh, want to uh, indicate the other sessions related to this topic of surgery uh, and Marfan syndrome. Preparing your child for surgery, children's heart issues, young adulthood surgery, adult aortic surgery, 
adult cardiothoracic surgery, peers, aortic measurements, understanding imaging. So you should be able to find what you want to know about surgery and Marfan syndrome. Thank you for your attention. Wow, that was that was great. Um, thank you so much, um, Dr. Tabacker and Dr. Jean Doe, um, especially for mentioning those other obsessions. A couple of them have passed, but if you miss something that you wish that you would have seen, you can look in the app and you will see the recording of that session. So there's some great information out there. So um, we have we have our speakers back. Let me stop sharing so we can look at them. There they are. Okay, great. So. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to go to the questions and answers that we have. Again, um, put them in the Q&A box. You don't have to raise your hand. Um, try not to put so much personal information. Let's just get the question out there that applies to everybody. So um, we're going to start with this um, most popular question. question. Um, people who are, in, who are recovering from open heart surgery, you know, their, their energy level is low because they're recovering from surgery and the medications they have to take. Um, and so what if you're, what if, um, um, what if you're, should you take, um, should you be in cardiac rehab or should you not be in cardiac rehab um, if your energy level is low? Are there studies related to this? Um, Dr. Zondo, you want to take that one? Your, your audio is off. There you go. Hey, I can take it if you want. So uh, usually after the surgery, you need some rehabilitation. That's better because uh, you are frightened by the surgery or you, we suppose you are frightened by the surgery and you feel you are not able to do what you, sh you are usually able to do and therefore to get back into confidence uh, rehabilitation is positive it's a psychological effect but it has also a physical effect because it helps you to do the right exercise to breathe uh, uh, normally and uh, it's usually very positive so rehabilitation after surgery yes is a good thing great thank you anything to add dr debacker no, I totally agree. I think rehabilitation is, is, is um, something that we highly recommend also in patients with uh, Marfan disease and patients having undergone um, aortic surgery. So uh, yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's, it's a physical and a mental um, uh, aspect that is important. And yeah, I agree. Great. Thank you. Um, here's another question. I'm currently in week five of recovery from open heart surgery. I'm walking several times a day and keeping an eye on my heart rate with a Fitbit. Everybody's doing that these days, right? Um, my heart rate sometimes goes quite high during very slow walking, but I don't know if I should be concerned about this. Is there a guideline for ideal heart rate for cardiac patients doing physical activity after surgery? Um, well, Dr. DeBacker, um, I'm going to start with you this time. Well, I, 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 I don't think there is a, a, a number that we can put on this. Um, the, the, uh, these uh, numbers on, on heart rate are also individually uh, uh, decided, but um, what is important is that you um, continue taking your uh, drugs from prior to surgery. So in many cases, these will be beta blockers and these will lower your heart rate, but it is perfectly normal um, if you are recovering and, and five weeks after surgery is still a short term, it's perfectly normal that your heart rate goes up a little faster because you will have lost some, some physical capacity and then, and then heart rate goes up. But um, also to, to monitor this, um, this is one of the reasons why cardiac rehab after surgery is so important because then you will uh, gradually increase your level of, uh, of exercise with um, proper monitoring um, on board. So um, I, 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 yeah, I, I realize and, and, and we are um, seeing more and more patients using Fitbits and, and things like that, but it's not always the most reliable um, um, thing to do. So um, I would, in this case, recommend rehabilitation in a rehabilitation center where you have um, good monitoring and that you can really get some reassurance and, and, and get to know your body again. That's, that's very important. So, uh, Diana, I, I'm, I'm not, no, sorry. no, I'm sorry. I don't want to put a number on an ideal heart rate. I think everything above 120 to put uh, a certain limit is, is, we would not recommend that in the early stages, but again, it's, it's very hard to put numbers on, on, on these uh, things. Exactly. Um, Diana, what was your experience post-surgery? 
to uh, like uh, like uh, like Dr. De Bakker said, um, I've been to a rehab center and they uh, monitor you very closely. And I think that's important that um, exercising is important, but uh, let it be monitored. Don't go out uh, by just by yourself using whatever app. Um, those apps are normally uh, made for um, let's quote healthy people and we are a different kind of people so be careful with that and uh, I had a lot of um, exercise through this rehabilitation center and uh, like uh, Dr. De Bakker said it's also a mental process and uh, they can help you uh, very well with that. Great thank you so much for sharing your experience. I'm Dr. Jean Doe is it necessary to take a beta blocker post-surgery um, if I already have low blood pressure and controlled heart rate? And what about mineral supplements after cardiac surgery, like potassium, phosphates, magnesium? Should cardiac surgery patients be taking these supplements long-term? So if you can comment on the beta blockers and on mineral supplements. Yeah, I think this is the prolongation of the previous question because the heart rate is obviously uh, modified by the beta blockade. So you cannot use your heart rate to monitor your exercise, which is the intensity of exercise usually in patients not taking a beta blocker. So the heart rate cannot be used to monitor your exercise uh, as in somebody who is not taking a beta blocker. So after the surgery, as I told, uh, usually just a part of the aorta is replaced, remaining that there is a lot of aorta remaining in place uh, and the entire aorta is affected by the disease so that the, pro the protection that you want to give to the aorta has to be given after surgery also. So there is no reason to stop a beta blockade because there has been surgery. And usually it is stopped or sometimes it is stopped during the surgery uh, for the time of the intervention mm -hmm. and then the heart rate goes up. And one problem that can occur after the surgery is that there is a atrial fibrillation, meaning that your heart rate is beating irregularly. And the prevention of that is usually the beta blockade again. So there is no reason to stop the beta blockade after surgery, that's clear. Uh, unless a specific problem occurs, of course. Now for the supplements, I, I'm not sure any uh, surgery can be responsible for the depression or something which is crucial. Meaning that uh, if there is no need for supplement prior to surgery, there is no need for supplement after surgery. Uh, you need to eat to be able to have muscle built again. You need to move to have your body strengthened. But there is no reason to think that you are missing a specific item that you should take to compensate for this uh, uh, loss. Great, great. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. DeBecker, um, after seven months of having a valve sparing surgery, a Marfan patient, um, are they more at risk of having a severe version of COVID than the general population? We knew we'd get some COVID questions here. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> the COVID questions, evidently. Um, well, um, let me first say that there is no evidence so far that patients with Marfan disease or, or Marfan related disorders are at increased risk for developing more severe forms of, of, uh, of COVID disease. Um, the, um, I, I don't think there's a clear answer yet to who, who is exactly at risk for developing these very severe um, courses of, of COVID-19. Uh, and this has to do with your immune system and this is not affected by the genetic defects or by the, the diseases of, um, of, of the aorta. Of course, in the initial weeks after surgery, you 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 will be weakened a little bit. That's 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 evident. I mean, it's 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 a major it's it's major surgery, cardiac surgery, whatever uh, type, um, and your uh, there, there is some resorption of blood. You, your your body needs to 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 heal. Um, and during that phase, I'm not going to say that you are more fragile and that, that it would be best to not um, get, uh, get infected with this, with this virus. Um, but again, um, the, the, the risk for patients with Marfan disease is, is not markedly increased. And um, if, if you are seven months after surgery, 
I think you it can be considered as as well as 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 not not healed, of course not, but uh, as as uh, recovered, and uh, that should not be be a problem. Which does not mean that you not take to need to take precautions and you need to follow the advice that we all need to do: keep distance and, and wear masks when needed, and wash your hands and all the stuff that we all do all day. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. That was bound to come up in the Mark Van Foundation and Professional Advisory Board has a lot of resources about this, which is on our website. And Deborah is going to put that link in the chat box for everybody. So you can download the different documents and they, they really reinforce what Dr. Gadacher just said. Um, um, Dr. Jando, I'm going to ask you this because you touched upon this in your presentation about um, reoperations. Um, somebody is asking, should I worry about having an ascending dissection after having descending graft surgery? Uh, the ascending aorta is uh, subject to dissection as a proportion of the aortic diameter. So I guess the answer is you should be afraid of having a dissection of the ascending aorta if your aorta is above a certain limit. And this certain limit is usually said to be 50 uh, millimeter. And we looked at our population that we follow which is uh, almost uh, 1,000 patients with a FBN1 mutation, uh, who were diagnosed prior to dissection, and then we follow them. And we have been following them for 10 years. And in all these populations, there has been three dissection occurring below 50 millimeter, which means it's not zero, but it's very, very, very low. So if there is a beta blockade, if there is exercise restriction, if there is regular echocardiographic measurement of the aorta, or even with a CT scanner when necessary, the risk of dissecting its ascending aorta is really very low. Uh, the fact that you had a dissection of the descending aorta is not today recognized as a risk for presenting a dissection of the ascending aorta. And usually it's the other way around. People are, are having surgery of the ascending aorta, and after that, they can have a dissection of the descending aorta. And usually, it's prevented by beta blockade, but it's not 100%. Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Diana now, because she's had several aortic surgeries, and she's nodding her head. Um, so you started with what? And then you were monitoring. And so when did you, how, did, how quickly did you need further surgeries? Um, I looked it up today. I had 12 aorta surgeries. Um, there's not a piece of my aorta that's my own. It's all in prosthetics, grafts, and stents. And like uh, Dr. John Doe said, in 2014, I had my root replaced uh, with a bit of the ascending uh, aorta. That was um, a planned surgery. And a year later, um, no, not even, uh, a half a year later, um, uh, the arch, so with a bit of uh, the descending part, um, was uh, dilated and uh, ruptured even. So after ascending came descending. Uh, so it's uh, yeah, in that in that particular case, I fit the profile. Um, but I started uh, when I was 21 with uh, an aneurysm in the abdomen. And then I worked my way up. So I was a bit uh, contra on most Marfan patients who go from up to down. I went from down to up. And um, I even got this, um, I don't know exactly how it's called in English, the last down part when it's split into, I don't even know the word for that. The, the bifurcation. The bifurcation. Sorry? The bifurcation of your aorta. Exactly, aerata. yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah. So I even got that one. And uh, even uh, small parts of artery uh, from, um, yeah, from down there. I don't know exactly the English well, word for it. Well, you look, you, look, you look great. And I guess the idea is to be watchful and all that. And so. Um, I've had uh, several angels on my shoulders. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Take angels at any time, right? Um, I'm going to go back to Dr. Jean Doe because here's just another post-surgery question. Um, um, somebody's had, they were talking about um, 
exercise and sports after surgery. And this particular person said they had David procedure 10 years ago and then um, dissection type B six months ago. And they're taking medication now for that one. Um, and is it possible to do slow sports now or should I wait a few months? months? Um, the, the type B is stable right now. So maybe talk a little bit more about the sports after surgery and what you worry about. Okay, so in sports after surgery, and I told the problem is the increase in blood pressure, and they are frightened by the fact that the increase in blood pressure is going to dilate the vessel. And because of the dissection, the aortic wall is thickened, is divided by two, and the dilatation is easier. So you want to be strict on the blood pressure control. That's the first thing. In the blood pressure control, you should not have your blood pressure going above 13, I would say. And then you have to be uh, careful when you do exercise. At the beginning, when there is a dissection, there is an increase in the size of the aorta, which, is, which can be rapid at the beginning. So I would recommend not to do exercise be before three months, something like that. Mm -hmm. And then the exercise you do would, should be uh, dynamic exercise, of course, not static exercise, and very progressive. And you should control the blood pressure. I think the key issue after dissection of a type B dissection is the blood pressure. Blood pressure, blood pressure, blood pressure. Is your blood pressure okay? Did you have a, a monitoring of the, your blood pressure with a, a, an apparatus on your arm for 24 hours? This is really the key is the blood pressure. And exercise, you can do exercise after this section, but you have to wait a little bit. So I think people like to hear like what sports are okay. And I think the best thing that I always hear is about moderation. Besides those contact sports, you know, football or, or European soccer, you know, really to do things in moderation. You're not going to go from after surgery to how intense you exercise before, right? Mm. Yeah, you don't want to do uh, intense exercise because when you do intense exercise, actually you are going to do isometric exercise. If you do, for example, you are, you are doing cycling, this is easy, and then you want to, 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 to do a maximum to as, be as rapid as possible, as fast as you can, then you are going to pull on your arm. And this is isometric exercise. So that's the case for all the exercise. When you want to do the maximum, then you are becoming isometric and the blood pressure is rising and that's what you, what you want to avoid. That's a good, that's a good guideline. Um, Can I say something, something about that? Sure. Absolutely. Um, also an example is uh, uh, horseback riding. It's not only the horseback riding, but maybe you get eye problems. Um, like I've been told, uh, like Dr. Chando said, the cycling, cycling is okay, but don't try to do the Tour de France. Right. <laughs> right? So exactly. don't go to the max. So the Marfan Foundation um, has a resource on uh, physical activity guidelines and people want to know like yes and no, but it's, it's not black and white, it's gray. And I, what we added in there, what, our, what a lot of the doctors added in there is what, what, what you worry about. It's not just that the doctors are telling you what you should or shouldn't do, but it's like, you need to make your decision. And here's, here's what they're worried about. Like Diana pointed out the eyes. Right now we're focusing on the heart, but um, that is a great point. And um, Deborah's gonna put the link to that resource in the chat box for everybody. Um, Dr. We can put we can put a link on on the website. We, we, Dr. Fondo has provided with uh, um, the patient organization also a video on exercise, so we can uh, provide you with that link as well. It would be yes, I would like that link. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely share that. We'll send it to you. Um, so okay, great, because we've there's so many questions on that. Um, Dr. DeBacker, um Here's somebody who is needing um, a mitral valve surgery. It's going to be her third, I, I don't know I said her, but it's going to be their third open heart surgery. How will the recovery be compared to the others? Will it be different? Yeah, um, that's a, a, a good question. Um, with every new surgery, the um, uh, technical procedure will become more difficult for the, for the surgeon. So um, you have to take into account that um, w after surgery with, with recovering of, of, of the tissue inside your, your chest, there will be some, some adherences inside and, and the surgeon needs to um, be, well, has more work to, to go into the field and it's, it's sometimes more difficult to, uh, to reach um, some, some of the structures. So um, the, the, the procedure will be, uh, will be more complex. Um, and the recovery after surgery, um, 
Um, yeah, there's, there's no clear line to be drawn here, I think. In some patients, some patients will, will recover as easy as, as, as after the first surgery, but there's, you have to take into account that every time that your chest gets opened, um, your joints that are moved, so joints in, in the back, joints in, uh, in the front of your chest, will be hurt a little bit. And um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think you have to take into account that your recovery may be a little more prolonged and, and, and that pain may be a, a, a more difficult issue. But maybe, Diana, you, 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 you are an expert. So. <laughs> I'm sorry. But... <laughs> yeah. yeah, but my chest has been opened three times mm -hmm. and uh, it was no uh, walk in the park. Um, um, so what would my answer be? Um, I think it's pain is so, uh, personal and, um, um, so I, I think I can't really answer that for me. It was, yeah, it was painful of course. And, uh, afterwards it's a long process to be, become the person you were before, if you are ever going to reach that state. Um, so hard to answer, actually. Yeah. Sounds answer. Like I've heard that it's very individual also. Yeah. Um, we had somebody on the other night and he just said everybody's is different. And you know, he talked about his, just like you're talking about yours. Um, Dr. Jean Doe, kind of on the same theme, somebody is saying that they're, they've been told they need two different um, aortic surgeries, ascending and for ascending and descending aneurysm. Um, how long um, between surgeries would you recommend? I, I, there is no systematic answer for that, I guess, because it's uh, really the balance between the need and the risk. And right. uh, the, 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 the need for the ascending aorta is depending on the diameter. If the diameter is 70 millimeters, then you don't want to wait and you want to do the surgery as soon as possible. Now for the descending aorta, if you need to have surgery for the descending aorta, it's usually because there has been a dissection which is going to dilate. This is, this is really not something so urgent and done in emergency as the ascending aorta. If there is a dissection of the ascending aorta, you have to operate within 24 hours. Uh, because the more you wait, the more the chance that the patient is dying. Uh, you, don't, you don't want to wait. You want to do surgery. This is a real emergency, ascending aorta. Now, descending aorta, usually you have time and you, you can wait for, depending on the situation, really, how, how fast it's dilating, you can, you can wait for days, weeks, years. I have people who have the section of the descending aorta that I follow for 20 now, 20 years, there is no surgery for them and it's remaining stable. So really it's a balance between the, the risk and the indication. And there is no there is no minimum time. If you need to do the ascending and then the descending, you can do it. Everything is possible. Diana is here to tell that uh, there is always a solution. That's great. Thank you so That's much. True. So we're going to go on to our our ending here. Um, and if I just ask our panelists to stay on webcam, we want to see you. Um, but I want to let everybody know that you know we tried to answer as many questions as we could here. If your question was not answered here. Um, please submit it to us through our help center um, at marthan.org slash e3ask, but please be patient. We have a lot of questions, as you can imagine right now. Um, we'll also try to go back into the, into the Q&A and perhaps answer some of those questions for you or direct you to other resources. We'd also love your feedback on this session, so please complete the survey in the app, and you can start by rating the session, which there's a little rating button right next to the Q&A button um, right in this session in, in the agenda. Finally, um, we hope you take care, you continue to take advantage of sessions throughout the summit and take every opportunity to connect with other people through the app. It's really been incredible seeing people meet other people just like them from countries all over the world. And if you share your experience and what you've learned on social media, please use our hashtag, which you see right there, um, E3 Summit 20. Um, and finally, I just want to let you know about in regard to future sessions that you might be attending, um, there's a lot of different opinions among the speakers. So we have the experts in the world, but this is an open forum. And so if you hear differences of opinion, that's normal. And um, you can certainly check with our help center and you can discuss and clarify things with them. So um, you know, we're just glad to have all these experts here to bring their vast experience and knowledge 
to all of you. So before we um, thank everybody, I'd like to go back to our panelists to see if they have any, if they have any last words. Um, Dr. Zondo, any final thoughts? Um, a final thought. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, post-surgery, I mean, the surgery, the indication for surgery is something difficult because there is the indication because of the risk and the indication because of the fear. The fear that something happens. And then post-surgery, which is a subject of today, uh, then you, you can expect to go back to a normal as, and to feel as well as you were before. That's, that's the expectation. And that's possible. But you are enriched by an experience, and this experience has to be taken in your personality now. So it's a plus in a certain way. Thank you. Um, Dr. DeBacker, any final thoughts? Oh, I just want to thank you and, and, and the um, organizing committee for setting this all up. And I want to thank Diana. It's, it's a pity that we have not had the occasion to, to meet in person yet. I'm sure this will happen in the, in the future. I'm sure and, of it. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's been, it's been very nice uh, talking to, to you. And, and my final words, as, as you said in the beginning, I think the most important message is listen to your body and, and, and um, yeah, um, every person is is a different person, and and there's it's very hard to set um, general uh, rules or or limits or whatever. And um, listen to yourself. I think that's a key message. Also after surgery. Great and great advice. And Diana, I'm going to give you the final word because you've been through so much. You came here, shared your experience, and you look amazing. We feel oh, amazing. Thank you very much. Feel again. amazing also. So do you have any final words for? Of course I do. <laughs> I've got a lot of words, but I'll keep it short. Yes. Um, <laughs> what I want to say to Marfan patients who are about to get surgery, any kind of surgery, uh, stay positive. Your thoughts will help you through it. I've had that experience myself. Um, so stay positive, stay as fit as you can before you go into surgery, the better you will come out. Um, so um, keep up your strength and uh, together we, uh, we can make it. Great. Thank you all so much. Have a great day and enjoy the rest of the summit. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Thanks all.